Okay, we are there. All right, so today uh, we will talk about uh, this lecture 17, and we have, we are going to a very important topic. It's one of the really favorite topics that is, uh, seriously, hemoglobin uh, anemia resource factor muscular system. So we will talk about the muscular system, I guess, uh, second. Why? Because muscular system is basically a lot of memorization, a lot of orient to get oriented where these muscles are, what are the most important muscles that we need to remember. And this part that is a little bit more, uh, I would say, uh, dense uh, with more information is the first portion, the hemoglobin, anemia, and resus factor. All right, so tell me, uh, just to start here, uh, do you know your your blood serotype? Somebody know your blood serotype? Yeah. Which 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 blood are you, uh, Damian? I'm O. O positive or negative? I believe positive. Yeah. O positive. Yes, uh, Marcel, please. Do you know your blood pressure? Your blood also pressure. O, positive. o positive. Erin, your your blood. I don't know. You don't know your blood. Okay, yeah. Okay. All right, Marilyn, your blood serotype. I'm not sure either. No. Okay. So you and Erin, you go together, okay, to take your blood uh, tests, okay? Miss, oh, oh, which blood test are you? Um, I'm B plus. B plus. B positive. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So yes, I am O positive as well. Okay, so O positive is uh, it's very important to know uh, your blood uh, serotype because you probably have an accident or you want to help somebody to donate your blood. Uh, that's why it's important to know always your, your blood serotype. Okay, all right, so uh, this is number one. Do, somebody, do you know somebody who is Rh negative? No. So what is what is the positive and what is negative? So why is called positive and why is called negative? What is in real in reality? What is serotype A, serotype B, O, A, B? All right. What is positive and negative? So that is something that we are going to talk today. All right. Do you know somebody who has anemia around, or you saw somebody who have anemia, or somebody who is concerned about anemia? Yes. Right, and these person are very young, is middle age or very old? It's old. Usually older. Old, right? So why is that happening, right? Why, just remember, elderly people always are more prone to have anemias. Elderly people are going to have, are going to be more prone to have anemias. How we are going to check the anemias and why elderly people are going to have more risk for anemias. That is what we are going to understand today. Okay. Another thing that you uh, we are going to focus is about a, besides that the causes of anemia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, there is a lot of nursing considerations about that. But there is some laboratory tests that you need to always keep in mind. This laboratory test test is the CBC. You know what is CBC? Complete blood count. Complete blood count. We are going to elaborate on that. But one of the uh, complete blood count, you're going to check what? Red blood cells, white cells, platelets, okay? And in addition, you need to know the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin and the, uh, and the hematocrit. You already know how much is the normal hematocrit? So in order to know the normal hematocrit, you need to remember what is hematocrit. What is hematocrit? Give me a number. We talk about the, the previous class. Hematocrit is the amount of red blood cells in blood. 
actually more than that is the percentage that the red blood cells represent in the whole blood. is the percentage of red blood cells that are present in the red in the in blood so what is the number 45 percent 45 percent remember that the laboratory tube listen to this this laboratory tube is small correct but let's suppose let's suppose and in this laboratory laboratory uh, um, tube you have that 45 percent so if this is the 100 percent high 45 percent will be about this so this is the amount of 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 red blood cells that we have in our body so now i want you to imagine instead to have a tube of 10 10 uh, a small tube here of the lab let's make a huge tube L let's make a huge tube and drain all the blood of a person take all the blood and put it in that tube how many we have? Four to five liters. And how much of red blood cells are going to be from, uh, uh, how much is the percent of red blood cells in that volume of four to five liters? You will find that is, again, 45%. 45%. So they, this tube that actually we take only a few mLs, they are going to represent the equivalent of the whole body. If you have different volumes of blood, always is going to be 45%, 45%, 45%, 45%. Even if you drain all the blood from the person, what is the percentage of uh, that blood, The percent, what is the percentage of red blood cells that are in that, uh, in that volume? It's going to be 45%. So from the total volume of the blood, 45% are red blood cells. Is that clear or no, please? And that 45% means what? What is the name? Everybody say it, please. Emato Crit. Say it. Please, everybody. Emato Crit. Oh, oh, I didn't hear you. Please, Emato Crit. Emato Crit. Emato Crit. Erin, I didn't hear you. Please. Emato Crit. Emato Crit. See, it seems, it's, if you say it, what I'm saying, why I'm doing that? Because you everything is in your mind but if you say it is another way that your senses are going to memorize things so repeat verbalize listen think write it down look at so use all your senses all right so let's keep going okay so saying that we have uh we have this is one example that we are going to do at the end is we are talking about percentage and uh, yeah, we are going to develop that at the end. All right. So now, please, I, you need, I'm telling you, please, you need to pay attention to these last lectures. That depends in uh, how much, how, well, how is your grade in the, at the final, or A, or B, or C, or D. So please, okay? So you want the, actually the, if you have B right now, you want A. You want C, you have C, you have, you need to, you want to have B. You have D, you want to have C. So in order to do to the next level, higher level, you need to do a more effort at this time. So please don't let this pass in the days. So need to start. All right, so we have the red blood cells are going to be called erythrocytes. We already know that they are going to be a span life of 120 days. 120 days. So this 120 days is the span life. Imagine, so January, February, March, April, your, the red blood cells that you have in uh, January is dead already. So they need to be replaced by new cells, right? So, and actually it's counting for every second. Every second we have red blood cells who are dying and dying, they reach 120 days average. And they are going to, lead into uh, they're going to go to the spleen the spleen is the cemetery so please i'm not saying this is really really important you to know that the red blood cells are going to die in the spleen it's very important why is very important 
because if you have abnormally dying red blood cells, your spleen is going to get enlarged. And that can be cause of bleeding, because it's the spleen is very fragile. Okay? So this is what we call splenomegaly. One of the causes of splenomegaly is the hemolysis. Hemolysis. What is hemolysis? Hemolysis, and this is all these need to be no, no, hemolysis is the destruction of the red blood cells. Destruction of red blood cells. When you have an abnormal, abnormal uh, destruction of red blood cells, you need to have a big cemetery. The big cemetery will be the spleen. So the spleen will be enlarged, will be enlarged. It's called splenomegaly. Spleno megaly, spleno megaly. Spleno means uh, spleen, spleno megaly. Megaly means B. All right, so we already know we are going to talk about that again and again because this is very important. And second, uh, we have the bicon biconcave shape. That is why we have the biconcave shape because they have no nucleus. We explained that in the previous class. So the red blood cells, when they are coming out from the red bone marrow, they are going to lose the nucleus. Losing the nucleus, there is, that space is not occupied by the nucleus. So what happened? It's going to have the, the red blood cell are going to have this biconcave shape because the nucleus is not present. So, and this means that they don't have DNA, no DNA no dna anymore because they are losing the nucleus and the dna as well so what does it mean that the red blood cells cannot multiply and reproduce after they come out from the red bone marrow you okay with that yes. yes okay okay so we have here the content of the red blood cells are going to be the hemoglobin, hemoglobin, hemoglobin. So please, I, this is the time that you need to remember that globin, globin, globin is the globulin. This globulin, what is a globulin? It's a protein. So please, don't overlook this. Globulin is very important. Globulin is a protein. Globulin is a protein. This protein has the property or the characteristic to carry actually the uh, the touch to the nucleo M. M, nucleo M is nucleo M. It's not nucleo of the cell, please. It's nucleo is like a, the center, the molecule. That is what is called uh, nucleo, uh, nuclear M. So the nucleus M is not the nucleus of the cell. M is actually uh, a complex protein composed by iron and other stuff that are going to capture the, uh, the, what? the oxygen and carbon dioxide and is associated with the protein glo uh, globulin and that's why it's called the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a transport protein, the hemoglobin, hemoglobin, hemoglobin. All right, so a hemoglobin, you heard about, for example, the immunoglobulin. The immunoglobulin are antibodies. With this all COVID-19, you know that, right? And these antibodies called, as well, immunoglobulins. What are these immunoglobulins? Globulins are proteins as well. So protein, globulin is a many important parts of the, our body. We have another one is the myoglobin 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 that we saw in the previous class myo means muscle globin means is a globulin protein this myoglobin have the characteristics to attract it's located in the muscles and have the properties to at, to be attached to oxygen oxygen myoglobin is going to give more oxygenation to your muscles myoglobin and as well, as we talked in the previous class, is going to use as a buffer, as buffer. 
Remember the buffers, bicarbonate, bioglobin. We have another buffer, bicarbonate. We have actually the hemoglobin as well. Hemoglobin is a buffer. Myoglobin is a buffer. Okay? All right. So here we have the hemoglobin is a protein that is located inside the red blood cell. This hemoglobin are going to have 40,000 molecules of hemoglobin in every single red blood cell. Okay? All right. So the red blood cells contain 120 uh, contain hemoglobin uh, that are inside the red blood cell. So blood volume. Blood volume, we have four to five liters of blood. That is basically the display of similar of six bottles of wine that you go to Safeway. So that volume is about the blood that you have in your body. All right. All right. So plasma is 55% of the of the of the whole blood volume okay and the red blood cells are going to be 45 percent and the other one white cells and platelets are going to be about one percent so just remember here if we have this is the hundred percent this is the hundred percent 55 percent is plasma 45% is red blood cells. 1% are going to be white cells and platelets. In the plasma, if we talk about the plasma alone, the plasma is going to be 90% water, and the rest are going to be about 8% proteins. And the rest, 2%, are going to be carbohydrates, lipids, enzymes, hormones, vitamins, minerals, etc. So that is what is plasma. Okay. So if you if you didn't have a good exam this time, uh, you 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 need to study double right now because this this uh, these uh, definitions are going to be used to understand this class and the next class. So please, if somebody have a doubt about that, some of you have some uh, doubt about that, just let me know. I can give you some time in order to go and study with you if that is needed, okay? All right, so here, red bone marrow, we have white cell, red blood cells, and platelets. So talking about the red bone marrow, the red bone marrow, this is, everything is important here. Rebo marrow uh, is the place where it's going to happen the hematopoiesis. 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 What means hemato? Hemato means blood, right? So blood. Blood is the general hematopoiesis. These hematopoiesis are going to produce, are going to divide in three big lines. One is the erythropoiesis, erythropoiesis, the production of white cells and the production of platelets, platelets. So please, the erythropoiesis is the production of red blood cells, red blood cells. So those are erythro, erythro means red. So please, for now and forever, don't ever I'm telling you, don't ever make a mistake that hematopoiesis is the same to say erythropoiesis. It's not. Erythropoiesis is a part or component of the hematopoiesis. When you're talking about hematopoiesis, you're talking about this erythro plus or white cells plus platelets. But when you're talking about erythropoiesis alone, that means red blood cells. Why is so important? Because NCLEX in the future they're going to ask you which drugs are to they're going to help to increase the red blood cells, and you're not going to put hematopoiesis because there is drugs that are going to be only for red blood cells, it stimulate the production of red blood cells. Other drugs stimulate the production of white cells. Other drugs are going to stimulate the production of platelets and why they are, need to be stimulated. 
because we have a lot of patients with cancer and patients with cancer are going to use chemotherapy and chemotherapy what is doing is to destroy the red bone marrow destroy the red bone marrow but the patients respond differently to the treatment so if somebody have chemotherapy some patients are going to be affected the erythro the red blood cells only so you have anemia so other patients are going to have not anemia but they are going to have white cells so risk for infections because the body cannot protect. And other patients can happen is they're going to decrease the number of platelets. So there's no coagulation. So you have risk for bleeding. And there, there's each of them depends on the response of the patient to the chemotherapy, you're going to have, you're going to be giving platelets, a stimulation of platelets, a stimulation of white cells, or the stimulations of the red blood cells. And that is the erythropoietin, erythropoietin. Is that clear or no, please? Yep, clear. Okay. All right, so is, is a, uh, hemoglobin is a transport protein, as we mentioned in the previous class, in the previous uh, minutes. Hemoglobin is a red pigment protein, transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. Yes, they're going to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. So where is coming from the oxygen? From the lung. What you breathe in, right? Gas exchange, simple diffusion between the alveoli and the uh, capillary. Correct? That is where it's coming the oxygen. The oxygen go to your bloodstream. Just imagine that got all the oxygen gate floated into the bloodstream and this oxygen they go for every single cell of your body right now from your head to your toe to your nails to your ears to your eyes every cell right now is receiving oxygen and then where is coming from the carbon dioxide lungs as well i didn't ask what how, where how the the CO2 is is eliminated. What is who forms or create the carbon dioxide? Who produces the carbon dioxide? Other tissues, waste. The, waste the heart. The heart from the um vein, what not vein, the artery. From artery. The, no, Miss O. -O. Miss O, I want you to pay attention to this. And this is exam question for exam. The carbon dioxide, as Daniel said, are coming from the metabolism of the cells. You don't forget the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle are happening in every single cell of your body. Why do we need Krebs cycle? Because they produce ATPs. And that is why we, that is every single cell. We have 100 trillion cells who produce carbon dioxide because the, 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 the glucose, the lipids are going to get into the Krebs cycle. They are going to produce ATPs but the waste product is going to be carbon dioxide. Remember, one more time, I was telling you the, the example of the bonfire, the bonfire, the bonfire is going to be your cell. Who is the bonfire? The cell. The, in the cell, what is coming? You have the logs. Who are the logs? The nutrients, the carbon, uh, carbon, uh, carbohydrates, the glucose that are inside the cell that need to be burned to produce ATPs is like the bonfire. The logs are going to be the carbohydrates. The oxygen, that's why you need oxygen. Oxygen, you, can, you cannot make fire without oxygen. So you cannot use the carbohydrates to produce energy if you don't have oxygen. This oxygen are going to burn and it's going to create a flame a flame 
that is representing the ATPs. And the smoke, the smoke that on bonfire is happening, that smoke is the waste product called carbon dioxide. So where is coming the carbon dioxide? From the cell metabolism, from the cell metabolism. That is where is coming the carbon dioxide. Okay, all right. All right, so here we have the hemoglobin are going to transport oxygen once it's having the gas exchange. When you inhale, they are going to pass by simple diffusion into the bloodstream. Carbon, they are going to carry the oxygen. The oxygen then are going to be delivered to the tissue. And when the oxygen is delivered to the tissue, why do we need to deliver oxygen to the tissue? Because the cells need oxygen to make ATPs. And then when the cells produce, produce ATPs, they are going to produce waste product that is the carbon dioxide. Inside the cell, they go outside the cell and go, and go to the bloodstream. And then it's eliminated by the lungs. Eliminated by the lungs. So hemoglobin cons consists in four molecules of globulins. So here we have one, two, three, and four. So that are the molecules of globulins. And in the center, in the center, we are going to have iron. These iron are going to attach to molecules of oxygen. Here we have iron and the iron. Why we have iron? Why we don't have uh, uh, gold or why we don't have, uh, I don't know, uh, other uh, gold, uh, zirconium, cadmium, or silicon, lithium? Why we, we have iron in our blood? Somebody can tell me why we don't why we don't have other elements. The answer is very simple. Very simple because iron have high affinity to oxygen. So that's why the iron when they find oxygen, they are going to attract the oxygen very fast. You want a proof of that? The proof of that is that go to your backyard and the backyard leave a, a, a metal for, let's put it two, three weeks there. Two, three weeks. This metal becomes rusty, yes or no? Yes. Right. This rusty. Rusty, what, 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 is, uh, what is this rusty? This rusty, uh, is a uh, rusty uh, already uh, metal is actually you are visualizing the reaction of the iron of the metal with the oxygen this rusty substance is the reaction of the oxygen with the iron because iron attract very much oxygen okay so that's why we have in the hemoglobin hemoglobin we have iron Okay. All right. So uh, each globulin attached to one nucleo M contain an iron. Okay, iron. Iron actually combined to one molecule of oxygen. So here we have this is oxygen in blue, but behind that is an iron. It's like a magnet. They are going to attract the oxygen. So one this this is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. This is hemoglobin. All this is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is composed by one, two, three, four molecules of globulin. And each globulin contains uh, one iron, 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 iron. And each iron attracts molecules of, of oxygen, 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 and oxygen. So when the, the, the blood is, tell me one thing. Can you see the veins of your arm, the veins here? Tell me, your blood is blue or what color is it? Blue. Blue, right? Look blue, right? Let's, let's go home. Cut your veins. No, no, don't cut your veins. But if you bleed from the veins, what color is the blood now? Red. Red, red, red right? So how come from blue to red? 
Oh, oh. How come from blue to the black? Blue, the blue color is the color of like a capillary that um, endothelium. I don't know. Be careful the, what you're saying. The, the wall, the wall of the wall of the the color of the wall. The, the vein. color of the wall. Uh, Erin, is that true? So my question um, is okay. My question is oh. oh if you cut your vein, your vein is blue, what you see in your arm. So why the blood is red when you're coming out? Is it because it's being exposed to oxygen? Oh, can you repeat that, please? It's being exposed to oxygen. Oh, no, 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 you mean Marcel. Oh, mm -hmm. repeat what Marcel said. Do you understand it's, that? Um, yes. Is it because of oxygen? Um. It's not because of the color the of the veins. Get rid out of your mind that that is not is not true. All right, so you're here to learn. So that's perfect. So now get rid forever that. What is the color you see in, the, in your veins is because of the color of the blood, not of the walls of the vessel. So you saw for anatomy, physiology, dissection that we colored, when you open a, a cadaver, you don't see blue. The walls of the veins are not blue. Are not blue. So the basically the walls of the veins and arteries in, in a real cadaver, you cannot tell the difference. Just just touching because of the thickness of the wall. But but I want you to tell you that it's blue because the blood is without oxygen. But when you cut your vein, that blood that is coming out is in contact with the oxygen of the environment. And that is why the blood is red, from blue to red. Is that clear, Ms. Hall? Yes. OK, excellent. All right, so this contact of the oxygen with the hemoglobin is called the oxyhemoglobin the oxyhemoglobin oxyhemoglobin oxy oxygen hemoglobin is hemoglobin right so and when they are attached to the carbon dioxide the carbon dioxide is called that the oxyhemoglobin the the oxyhemoglobin the oxyhemoglobin is that clear so tell me when the when the blood is in contact with the oxygen. How is that called, Miss O? -O? Marilyn, can you help? Uh, hemoglobin. No. Oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin. Miss O, -O what is oxyhemoglobin? When oxygen is attached. To whom? To hemoglobin. Very good. So oxyhemoglobin. And what is the oxyhemoglobin? The oxyhemoglobin is that we have the hemoglobin that are going to be without oxygen, without oxygen. We okay with that? All right. Then we have gas the gas exchange. You already know the gas exchange is happening between the alveoli and the alveoli and the, uh, and the capillar. At the level of you know, at the level of the lungs, right? So by different concentration gradients that is going to go towards towards or down the concentration gradient from higher concentration to low concentration, that is what is going to happen. The gas exchange. Don't overlook that because when you are doing your nursing assessment, you are going to check that exactly that the gas exchange. How you check the gas exchange? You guess you you can check the gas exchange with the oximeter. Oximeter. The oximeter is like you are looking what is happening between the alveoli and the capillar. So all right. So and don't overlook that. Okay. Simple diffusion. All right. All right. So tissues consume oxygen for production of ATPs. We already know that by cellular aerobic respiration that pro and produce. 
carbon dioxide that is the metabolic waste. There you are. There you are. Okay. So I want I want just to take my time here just to explain you something. And please, I want you to visualize this. You know the heart. The heart is going to pump out arterial blood, correct? A lot of oxygen, correct? Okay. Yeah. So, so this blood rich on oxygen coming out from the heart, they are going to go and distribute the oxygen towards the tissue. So they go from the heart, from the heart, they go to the rest of the tissue. So there you have this amount of oxygen. And when you go more distal, the blood is going away from the heart, the, the, the blood is going to lose the oxygen because it's delivering. So instead you have this amount, little by little, you have less and less and less and less, less oxygen because the oxygen is being distributed, delivered to the tissue. But at the same time, at the same time, this blood that coming from the heart was very rich in oxygen. The cells start to produce ATPs and start to basically send carbon dioxide to the blood. So at the beginning, you have this amount of, of oxygen, but a little bit of carbon dioxide. But as more they go di uh, more distributing the oxygen, you have less, 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 less oxygen, but you have more, 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 more carbon dioxide. So when the blood, when it's coming back, when it's coming back, they have carry a lot of carbon dioxide, but a little bit of oxygen. And this carbon dioxide is coming from the metabolic waste of the cells. They go to the heart, pump to the, to the lungs, gas exchange, high concentration of carbon dioxide. When you inhale, you have low concentration of carbon dioxide, but the blood that is coming, towards the lung is high concentration of carbon dioxide. So low from you when you inhale, but high what is coming back. So go from the, uh, towards the concentration gradient or down the concentration gradient means that they go from high concentration to low concentration. And that is how the carbon dioxide go from the bloodstream into the lungs. Okay, is that clear or no, uh, Mar uh, Marilyn? Are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. Thank you, Dr. G, for that example. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, here we have, when you're talking about this is the oxygen, right? So with oxygen, without oxygen, but we have here the hemoglobin when it's loaded with carbon dioxide, we call the carbo, carboxyhemoglobin. 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 Those are questions for exam. Carboxyhemoglobin. So uh, hemoglobin loaded with carbon dioxide is carboxyhemoglobin. Hemoglobin without oxygen is called the ox, the, uh, is going to be called the oxyhemoglobin and when this loaded with oxygen is oxyhemoglobin so just remember oxygen oxygen with oxygen oxyhemoglobin without oxygen deoxyhemoglobin if you're talking about carbon dioxide carbon dioxide co2 is that carboxyhemoglobin carboxyhemoglobin okay all right so what is the carbon monoxide this is co carbon monoxide the carbon monoxide This carbon monoxide is basically uh, uh, coming from uh, from where? For uh, I would say an incomplete, incomplete uh, burning of things. For example, uh, we have well, all right. So I'm going to give you some example. Carbon monoxide coming from the exhaust of the cars. Do you do you uh, do you hear this um, kind of I don't know is that I didn't hear this a long time ago but people who are let's make it uh, some example here a person who is drunk somebody is drunk and barely they made it to the home barely they make it to the home so they open the garage and they close the garage and the person fall asleep in the car with a car on, 
the next day, the patient appears dead. Do you hear that? That, that things? You know, yeah, carbon monoxide poisoning. Exactly, carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide poisoning. All right, so listen to this. This is very important, okay? So you have a person who are being inhaling carbon monoxide because he was basically drunk, he was sleeping, and he was inhaling only carbon monoxide. So what is the difference with carbon dioxide? Okay, look at this. You and I, right now, you are inhaling oxygen and the carbon, di and carbon dioxide produced by the body are going to get rid through the lungs. Okay, listen to this. Carbon dioxide is very easy to get attached and detached from the hemoglobin. In order to carry oxygen, because if you remember, remember that the site of a hemoglobin, the same sites in the hemoglobin to carry oxygen are the same sites to carry carbon dioxide. Right? It's like you have one chair and you want to sit down two people. So you cannot sit down two people. So if you want to sit a person A, they sit down in the chair. And then if you want to make the patient the uh, patient B to sit down, you need to stand up. A, need to stand up to make a space for B, okay? So that is what happened with the hemoglobin between the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide, they need to be eliminated in order to make a space for the oxy oxygen to get attached to the hemoglobin. Okay with that? That is normal. That is what happened with you and me. Um, and yes. And what happened with the carbon monoxide, CO? The carbon monoxide, once it's been sitting in the chair, he doesn't want to go out. He doesn't want to stand up. He is not going to go and is uh, not going to be able to, you cannot remove it from that hemoglobin. So if you cannot do that, there is no space for oxygen to get attached in the hemoglobin. And that's why the patient died. Do you agree with that? It's understood or not? We understood that? Is that clear? Yes. Very clear, Marilyn? Very clear? OK. So the patient is going to, you're going to see blue with a lot of uh, uh, salivation because parasympathetic, whatever. And uh, what is the treatment for that? The treatment for that is just give oxygen. There is no other treatment and just cross fingers because that carbon monoxide is very little. So that's why they have these kind of uh, sensors in the house, the, this, uh, the city coming to bother us just to check everything. If there is some kind of uh, detectors for carbon monoxide. And remember that carbon monoxide is col colorless colorless, colorless. You cannot see the smoke of carbon monoxide. You cannot smell it. You cannot smell it and you cannot see it. So that's why it become very dangerous. Okay? Okay. And that's the question for the exam. All right. All right, so let's talk about anemia. Yes, I like this. Okay. Okay, let's talk about anemia. Okay, so please, I want just to tell you something here. Anemia, anemia as definition is the low number of red blood cells. low number of red blood cells, low number of red blood cells. Okay, so when you have low hemoglobin, low hemoglobin, what is hemoglobin? Is the amount of this 
protein that you have in your body, low hemoglobin. This low hemoglobin is going to be an indicator of anemia. But the definition of anemia is the low number of red blood cells. Obviously, if you have low number of red blood cells, you will have low levels of hemoglobin. So, in conclusion, hemoglo uh, uh, low levels of hemoglobin not necessarily is telling you that is anemia. Low levels of hemoglobin as, uh, is an indicator that can be an anemia. But the definition of anemia is the low number of red blood cells. Okay? So what is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin, remember the red blood cells having these molecules of hemoglobin, as you show, I show you here. This one. You see here, each red blood, this is a red blood cell. The red blood cells are going to have hemoglobin. We have 24,000 of these molecules in every single red blood cell. So this hemoglobin, the levels of hemoglobin are going to be between 12 to 14 grams per deciliter. And in males, 14 to 16. So I want you to remember that. 12 to 14, 14 to 16. 12 to 6, 12 to 14 is the hemoglobin. Grams, listen, grams per deciliter. Grams, grams, that is important. Grams per deciliter. So now, what is one deciliter? What is one deciliter? The thousand milliliters. Thousand milliliters. One is that is not a, a one liter. One deciliter. Deci means what? Deci means what? Deci. When you say decimal, what is telling you? It's one tenth of a liter. Exactly. Decimal. This is one tenth of a liter. Just nail it now because you will see a lot of laboratory tests about that. Not only here, but everywhere. Deciliter means 100 ml. What is 100 ml? It's one tenth of a liter. So 1,000 divided by 10 is 100. So that means 100 ml. How much is 100 ml? It's about the, the, the half of a cup of coffee. That is about 100 ml. Visualize that. Many of you, okay? So 100 ml. All right? So now, if you do the calculation, how many grams of how many grams of hemoglobin you have in your body? Very simple. If you have 12 grams per deciliter, how much grams of hemoglobin you have in your body? If you have 12 grams of hemoglobin in 100 ml. How much grams of hemoglobin are going to be in 4,000 ml? Yes or no? Yes. Right? So 12 grams per 4,000 ml divided by 100 ml is going to be equal X. ml and ml goodbye, one, two zeros, one, two zeros. So 40 times 12, that is 48. 48 and plus one zero, what? Grams. Grams. And that is in pounds, just to give you an idea, is going to be uh, divided by 2.1, 2.2, sorry. And that is going to give you 
so 480 grams but that is means that is 0 0.48 kilograms times kilograms here and pounds here one kilo is 2.2 pounds so Zero point sorry eight times two point two pounds. That is going to be one about one pound. One point zero five pound. One pound. One pound. One pound. Okay. So that is what you have in your in your blood right now. Right now, how many grams you have? One pound. One pound. One pound of hemoglobin in your in your body. One pound is a lot. Imagine one pound of meat and one pound of something. So one pound is, just to give you an idea, is, is like uh, five bagels. The weight of five bagels. Five bagels. Put five bagels together. So that is basically your uh, the weight of hemoglobin you have in your body. Yeah, I'm trying to be, make you visualize that. And please, that deciliters, don't forget ever. How much is one deciliter, Miss O? One ton liter. One, what? What? One, what, what is Ten percent of the liter. Yes, what, for, excellent. Hundred ml, right? Hundred ml. Hundred ml, correct? One deciliter. One deciliter is ten ml. Yeah, hundred ml. Deciliter is hundred ml. Write it down ten times, okay? Hundred ml. I'm I'm not trying to bug you or anybody. I just want to be sure that you don't have problems later. That is my thing. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, so we have major causes of anemia. The major causes of anemia. So we are going to talk about that. All right, so we have iron deficiency, folate deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin E deficiency, caused by infection, malaria, sickle cell disease, hemorrhagic anemia, aplastic anemia, no producing red blood cells. So let's elaborate this very fast. And we are going to do some inklets right now. What happened? Okay. Okay, so nutrition related anemia. Okay. So one is that is going to prevent, we have, first of all, if you decrease the production, if you increase the destruction, If you have uh, uh, invasion, so destruction will be, for example, we are going to have free radicals. We are going to have infections. Destruction will be weak walls of the red blood cells are going to be, for example, a, a radioactivity, like chemotherapy. Okay, so look at this. All right, so iron deficiency. Iron deficiency means that you have iron deficiency, no iron in your, in your system. And why we need iron? Iron is needed in order to produce hemoglobin. This iron, if there is no present of iron, presence of iron, you cannot produce enough hemoglobin. So you have low numbers of red blood cells. Okay, iron. Iron are needed for to produce hemoglobin. So you have iron deficiency, you have low levels of hemoglobin. 
folate folate please remember this folate is the same to say folic acid uh, please this ex this exam is coming i'm going to make it very intense so you need to know exactly what i'm saying here so it's going to be for your good not for mine okay folic acid oh vitamin b9 We have the vitamin B12, another one, vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 and B9. So B9 is the folic acid or folate. And the vitamin B12 is the, you don't need to remember the name, cyanocobalamin. We don't need to just remember vitamin B12. So why is important the vitamin B9 and vitamin B12? Vitamin B9 and B12 are going to promote the multiplication cell division on the red bone marrow to produce red blood cells right so cell division so how you 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 need to remember vitamin b9 and b12 cell division where in the red bone marrow cell division if you have low levels of vitamin b12 and vitamin b9 you will not be able to produce red blood cells. You okay with that? Yes. Good. Yes. Yeah. Another one is the iron. Iron, iron is not a vitamin, it's a, a mineral. And this iron, if you don't have enough ingredients to create to cook a, to prepare a cake, if you don't have sugar, you don't produce enough, enough you don't you are not going to produce the number of cakes that you was doing before because it's not going to work right so you cannot sell so you don't produce more cakes if you don't have enough sugar you cannot produce enough cakes and that is what happened with the iron the iron are going to be that ingredient so without iron you don't have enough red blood cells and the vitamin e vitamin e Vitamin E is, a, is an antioxidant, antioxidant, antioxidant. What is an antioxidant? Anti, what, so you need to remember the free radicals and you need to remember the antioxidant. The free radicals are going to be the uh, the opposite of antioxidants. Free radicals are that hot potato, extra electrons, extra electron, free, radi free radicals, free e, 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 electron, 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 free radicals are going to destroy the cells. And the antioxidants are the ones who are going to get rid of the free radicals. Get rid of the free radicals. If you have here a red blood cell, a red blood cell and the red blood cell are going to have a lot of free radicals i don't know you somebody smoke or have some other substances free radicals around the red blood cell these free radicals are going to be the hot potato are going to destroy the red blood cell but what happened you if you eat if you take some antioxidants the antioxidant what they're going to do is to sweep out all the free radicals out from the cell so now is it's like sweeping out all the free radicals that is an antioxidant and who is this antioxidant vitamin e vitamin e vitamin e vitamin e so vitamin e is an antioxidant if you have low levels of vitamin e there is nothing to protect the red blood cell from the free radicals so the free radicals will be destroyed. The, are going, the red blood cells are going to be destroyed. Is that clear? Yeah. Um, Dr. G. Yes. Where it's on your um your drawing above chemotherapy. What does that say? The walls. Oh, cell membrane. Okay, we will put here. Weak cell walls. Okay, cell membrane. Weak. You cell membrane okay all right so we are going to go into that right now 
¿Ok? Okay, so we, we already talked about the iron, folic acid, and vitamin B12. Is that clear or not, please? Clear here. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we are talking about hemolytic anemia. Hemolysis, hemolysis, hemolysis is the destruction of the red blood cells. Destruction. Destruction of the red blood cells. Hemolysis is citolysis. Citolysis is the destruction of a cell. But we are not talking about that. We are talking about hemolysis. It's the destruction of the red blood cells that are going to basically uh, destroy the hemoglobin, okay? So, hemo hemolysis, what is hemolysis in, in congruous? This is a red blood cell and the red blood cells are going to blow up, blow up. That is hemolysis, okay? All right. So now, saying that, and we are going to do that table in the next, in, uh, again, are going to be caused by infection. So the malaria. Malaria, listen, malaria, what is doing is this. Do you know somebody with malaria? No. Well, I'm the champion of malaria because I had it twice when I was in the Amazon. Yeah, very, it was very, very good experience, by the way, twice. So what happened is the mosquito is biting you because why the, and you know the mosquito who bite you is the female only because the female wants only blood. The female mosquito, they have always blood. The male doesn't want blood. And why Why the female want blood only? Why? Because the, the female found some factors in human's blood that make grow the eggs of the, of the mosquito. Okay, so that's why. So now, when they put the, the needle in your body, they're going to send you a parasite. So the... The mosquito is not cause of the malaria. The, the mosquito is the bus, is the train of the, of the microbe. That is, uh, I'm not going to say it now, plasmodium vivax, whatever. And that when you put the needle inside your skin, they are going to inoculate or pass the microbe. This microbe go to your, to your bloodstream and they go and they go to the liver. From the liver, they go to the red blood cells. And what happened? There is huge invasion of these parasites into the red blood cells. A lot. I'm not saying because I like to talk about malaria, because my, I, I will not even talk about malaria because in NCLEX, HESI, they ask about malaria. So this is not overlook this, okay? So what happened here? this uh, microbe get into the red blood cells and the red blood and the microbe start to reproduce, 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 reproduce. Reproduce so many that the red blood cells are totally tight. So it's like a balloon with a lot of air inside. And suddenly, boom, the red blood cells are going to die. That is hemolysis. But it's not only one red blood cell are going to be billions and billions and billions of red blood cells that are going to rupture at the same time. At the same time. Why? Because that is the cycle of life of the, because they are going to invade from the liver, they go out of the blood like in one group, big group. And that big group invade all the red blood cells. And all the red blood cells start to swell and swell with a lot of microbes and then blow up. And that causes a lot of fever. When the cells are going to rupture, hemolysis, you have a lot of fever, fever, and make you shake, like a shake, like, I don't know, like maraca or whatever. I don't know how you call that, but very bad shaking and fever, very much shaking. And that is going to destroy a big number of red blood cells. 
and that can lead into anemia, into anemia. So if the red blood cells are dying, the spleen get enlarged. And that is a splenomegaly. Whatever reason there is hemolysis, the spleen always is going to get enlarged. And that is how you can assess the patient and tell that most likely it's a cause of hemolysis that is occurring here. We okay with that? That can lead into anemia. Anemia. And this cycle is going to be repeated every three days because the cycle, life cycle of the of this parasite are going to be three days, three days, three days, three, four days, three, four days, three, four days, three, four days. Three, four days. So every three, four days you have fever. And shake is called anemia. So is at the end you will have anemia. Yes. Is it just antibiotics that gets rid of the malaria? Is it the no, treatment? No, no, it's, it's uh, antimicrobial. It's not uh, considered uh, antibiotic. It's the uh, hydroxychloroquine and the primaquine, called the fancy that. So those are actually antiprotozoal. Antibiotics is for bacteria. The, the microbe for malaria is a protozoa, family of the amoeba, Fasciola, whatever. And this uh, protozoa is called a plasmodium vivax. It's a plasmodium. So we will talk that in anatomy and physiology, but it's very interesting. You okay with that? Okay. All right. So now for the structure, right? Hemolysis. So let's keep moving. Hemorrhagic and oh, sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease. The sickle cell disease is, uh, we have a uh, major, minor, well, whatever. Sickle cell disease mostly is common in Africa, and that was a reaction in order to uh, make resistance to malaria. So but I'm not going to go that. So what is the red blood cell? This is the red blood cell. And the red blood cell, the walls are going to become weak. Weak. And the red blood cells are going to have now this shape. like a sickle cell disease, sickle cell. It's, that's why it's called sickle cell. So weak cell membrane. As I said, was a cell membrane. So weak cell membrane. So when they go through the capillaries, through the capillaries, these angles are going to basically get actually, because the capillaries are very narrow and they are going to have a lot of trauma. And they are going to the this because of the weak cell membrane. Because why? Because in the sickle cell disease is a recessive, uh, recessive uh, disease that causing that some proteins are not present in the cell membrane. So absence of some proteins. So the absence of some proteins. number are going to decrease are going to make are going to make the cell wall weak the cell membrane sorry cell, wall. cell membrane are going to be weak so any mechanical force are going to destroy the when they have this uh, uh, low number of, of proteins in the cell membrane the the red blood cell become like this sickle cell sickle cell so like the shape of the moon right and that is, weak, is already weak. So they have a lot of hemolysis, a lot of hemolysis, sickle cell disease. Okay? Do they also have a, a harder time moving down the bloodstream because of their shape? That's correct, especially when they go to the capillaries. When they don't have problems when they go to the big arteries. But in the capillaries is where you have this uh, hemolysis. Okay? Hemorrhagic anemia is when you lose blood. When you're losing blood, you're losing not only plasma, you're losing red blood cells as well. So they can lead into anemia. A plastic anemia, a plastic anemia is when you receive chemotherapy. Chemotherapy. 
o radiotherapy? Do you think it's going to be seen in chemotherapy? No, there is other medications. You're going, you need to know ganciclovir, you need to go see dobudin, you need to know the uh, uh, many uh, chloramf uh, no, uh, uh, sulfas that can produce actually anemia, megaloblastic anemia. So that is called aplastic anemia. So destruction, that what it means, destruction of the red bone marrow. And just to give you some of that, it's easy to remember chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So they can destroy the erythropoiesis, erythropoiesis. Do you agree with that? Yep. Got it. How to remember yeah. this? Here we have a red blood cell. This is, yes, draw a red blood cell. These red blood cells are going to have iron deficiency causes for anemia. Vitamin 9 deficiency, vitamin 12 deficiency. So you cannot produce the hemoglobin. No hemoglobin. Then you have the cell membrane are going to be the sickle cell disease. Another one are going to be the free radicals. Deficiency of vitamin E. The invasion or infection, malaria. The loss of, loss of blood, bleeding. I know it causes bleeding. And destruction of the rebel mother. So if you see here inside the wall and what is coming from outside, just try to visualize that, okay? So those are the causes of anemia, causes of anemia. One thing, yes, before we go to the lunch break. Where are you? Okay. All right, so this is NCLEX, Marcel, Daniel, okay? Marilyn, oh, oh Amy. This is NCLEX, don't forget that. So tell me, do you know somebody with anemia? And so they say, oh, you know what? My neighbor, or oh, I found somebody in the street who was telling me, oh, this is good for anemia. Oh my God, I don't want to hear that ever. Because that is for people who doesn't even put a foot in the medical school, okay? So, this is good for anemia. Take this, take that. All right, so now listen to this. You never, you never treat anemia, you never treat anemia without knowing the cause. Okay? So say, oh, you know what? This, this uh, iron is so good, they're making you uh, your anemia is going to get better. And that is not true because the problem is not the iron, maybe. The problem is the vitamin B12. So you can have three kilos of vitamin of iron every day, but the anemia is going to still the same. So that's why you cannot tell by just looking or, or asking they need laboratory tests in order to find out what is the cause or the reason of anemia. Do you get with that? All right, the second part of anemia is very interesting, right? You, you like anemia? Oh, you like anemia or no? Yeah, okay. So let's have a lunch break. Uh, I'm going to see you uh, 12, 16. Okay, you want lunch break, right? Lunch break? It's okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. 12 16. I will see you then.
Uh, guys, can you please uh, give me a couple minutes, please? I have a, a, a call uh, from the school. So please give me a couple minutes, okay? Thank you, thank you. Okay, guys, so sorry for that. It's just the pharmacology students. All right. All right, so let's get the start. Okay, so here we have all the ma the four major causes. So I, actually, uh, I don't, I will suggest to when you study this, Try to study directly iron. So don't don't get the classification because this is useful to to organize our mind. But definitely, uh, if you really you you can do that if you if you want. But definitely, just remember the causes of anemia: iron, vitamin B9, B12, vitamin E, uh, infections, uh, sickle cell disease that is related to the uh, weakness of the cell membrane. Hemorrhagic anemia means the loss. Remember the four type of hemorrhage, uh, one, two, three, four. And uh, aplastic anemia that is caused by affecting the red bone marrow. Okay? All right, so now uh, here we have the, uh, we have uh, ox uh, not enough hemoglobin going to lead into anemia. So this is very important. Why? Because if you don't have enough hemoglobin, means that you don't have enough number of red blood cells. Okay. All right. So not enough hemoglobin to transport oxygen. Do not able to produce ATPs as quickly necessary. So we are going to feel tired, fatigue. You're going to feel uh, actually dizzy, uh, dizziness, and uh, or fainting. All right. So what are the signs and symptoms of anemia? Now, one of the things that you need to remember is one of the cause, one of the signs and symptoms of anemia will be the increase of the heart rate. 
increase of, of the heart rate. Increase of the heart rate. So why is that? Let's go to uh, uh, Amazon Deliver. Amazon Deliver, they need to deliver, they need to deliver a, a hundred packages in, uh, 1,000 packages in, in uh, during the day. 100 packages, uh, 1,000 packages in a day. Okay, so you have, I don't know how many trucks. You have, let's make it like 100 trucks that are going to deliver that 1,000 packages in one day. Now, in order to, now, the next day, they don't have 100 trucks anymore. Let's suppose that they have 50 trucks, trucks so the half of the trucks. And they need to deliver the same number of packages in, 20, in, the, in that day. So what they need to do, the trucks, in order to deliver with less trucks, the same amount of packages to the, to the people. So what they need to do is to go faster. Yes or no? Make sense or not? Make sense. Yeah. So who are, who are, the, who are the trucks? The tracks are the red blood cells. So you have less red blood cells. In order to distribute in the same amount, the same amount of oxygen, the packages, the cars, they need to go faster in order to compensate that low level, low number of tracks or red blood cells. And that's how the faster means your heart rate is going to be higher. You okay with that? All right. So now, it's going to be poor exercise tolerance. <clears throat> Why is going to be poor exercise tolerance? Why? Because when you are doing exercises, your demands of your needs of oxygen are going to be higher. And the body is not able to do that because they have low number of tracks of Amazon. And they actually, for more that they can increase the heart rate, that are going to not be enough to, because the the needs of oxygen are going to be much higher when you are doing exercises. All right, so feeling faint and severe anemia, lactic acid. So lactic acid. Lactic acid, let's go back to the, our biochemistry. And you already know that we have the glucose, that is the main source of energy, are going to go into pyruvic acid. And pyruvic, that, area, that is called the glycolysis. Glycolysis happen, as you remember, in the cytoplasm is anaerobic, no need of oxygen, no need of oxygen, no need of oxygen, produce two ATPs, plus the reversible reactions that you already know. So then they turn into pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid, then they go into the mitochondria, where we need oxygen. That is the area that we need oxygen for the Krebs cycle, for the Krebs cycle. So. The, the body cannot get used, cannot get the Krebs cycle because it's a lack of oxygen to burn the glucose and produce ATPs. So what happened? The pyruvic acid start to accumulate because they cannot get into the Krebs cycle. And the pyruvic acid produce lactic acid. Lactic acid, lactic acid is, a, for example, uh, example, when you are doing exercises and you are not used to do exercises, you produce lactic acid, your body is totally in pain, right? So this lactic acid is because actually it's equivalence that you cannot provide enough oxygen because you are not trained to do those amount of exercises. It's the same that you cannot have enough red blood cells to deliver oxygen to the, to the cells. So the body is entered into anaerobic metabolism. So they are going to get into glycolysis. Why? Because Plus, they have produced two ATPs. Instead, it's, it's better to, to have two ATPs than nothing. So that's why the pyruvic acid turns into lactic acid. Excess of pyruvic acid are going to lead into uh, excess of lactic acid. Lactic acid, what is lactic acid? Lactic acid is acid, and that can lead into acidosis, blood acidosis. It's not related to the lungs, it's related to the rest of the body, so that is called metabolic acidosis. You okay with that? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we have nutrition-related anemias, so iron deficiency. Iron deficiency, 
the iron is part of the hemoglobin, not enough iron, they are going to produce what we call, and that is question for the exam, is an anemia that when you see that in the microscope, the red blood cells normally, let's make it like this size, the red blood cell, now the red blood cells are going to become a smaller, a smaller, a small, and they are going to have not enough hemoglobin here, not enough hemoglobin, so they cannot uh, capture oxygen, so the color of the red blood cell is not red anymore, and it's going to be pale, pale, pale. So the red blood cells, when they have anemia by iron, by iron, by iron, by iron, by iron, are going to be small and pale. Pale is going to be called hypochromic. Chromic means color, low in color, hypochromic. And a small are going to be called microcytic. Microcytic is, uh, there you are, microcytic. Microcytic is small. Micro means small, cytic means cell, a small cell. And hypo means low, chromic means color. So it's going to be a small and pale. That is when you have iron deficiency, iron deficiency, iron deficiency, iron deficiency. Now, this iron deficiency is going to be very common in female, in female. Remember, the hemoglobin that is an indicator of the number of red blood cells, the hemoglobin in female is 12 to 14. 12 to 14. In male is 14 to 16. In male is 14 to 16. Why do you think the hemoglobin are going to be lower or we have loss of iron in female? Why female is low? Lower iron production. Due to um, the menstruation. Excellent are going to be caused by the menstrual cycle. So you're losing blood every every month. How much blood you uh, a woman lose for a menstrual cycle? Between 50 ml to 80 ml. So it's going to be like the half of a half of a cup of a cup of coffee. Half of a cup uh, half of the cup of coffee, the half of that are going to be amount of blood that a female are going to lose every every month. So that's why they are going to have some deficiency of iron. So they need to eat more iron. You okay with that? Um, Dr. G, what was the um, the amount of blood loss again? 80 ml. 58. Thank you. Okay. All right. So. That is, uh, uh, we will talk about tampons and all that. Tampons is very important because that is giving you an idea how much blood a woman is losing, if that is the case of uh, increase of bleeding. So that is another topic. Okay, another time. All right, so how we can, how, how we can actually, uh, uh, if we have a microcytic, mic, um, uh, microcytic hypochromic anemia, there is other causes of iron deficiency, especially with cancers. Cancers. Cancers, the tumors are having some bleeding, some bleeding, some bleeding. Why is this bleeding? Because the, the look at this, the cancer cells, cancer cells are going to create masses, masses. These masses are going to grow very fast. But these cells who are growing and making a mass, making a mass, they are going to, they are living organisms. They are living cells, abnormal cancer cells. The difference is that they reproduce without a stop. And these are need oxygen and they need, they need uh, blood. But what happens when the mass are going to be too, uh, uh, they are going to grow very fast, the, the vessels are not forming fast enough to produce blood supply to these cells. And what happens? Some cells are going to die and they are going to produce some bleeding, some bleeding. 
And that is one of the things that we see in cancer. In cancer, we have iron deficiency as well. Okay? All right, but that is pathology. Let's go to the uh, normal uh, normal thing. All right, so we have how, how we can uh, prevent or we can actually uh, minimize this problem of the iron deficiency. What we call is the meat factor. Question for exam, meat factor. The meat factor, the meat. The meat they have contain a lot of iron. So steaks, T-bone, uh, whatever you want. So the meat factor, chicken, whatever. So meat factor, especially the beef meat, all right? So those are that contain high levels of iron, high levels of iron. You okay with that? Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's go back to that. All right, so now, all right, so, but let's finish with the, with the iron and we are going to talk together with the vitamin B12. These two slides are going to go back in a few moments. Okay. So what is, if I ask you, what do we need, uh, why we need iron? We need iron to produce hemoglobin. Okay. Why do we need iron? To produce hemoglobin. And don't forget that. So if you don't have iron, you don't have enough hemoglobin, the cells are going to be the red blood cells are going to be lower in number and poor in levels of hemoglobin in the cells. Now, let's talk about vitamin B12 and vitamin B9. B9, folic acid or folate, that I mentioned that before, it's a question for the exam. Vitamin B12 and B9 promote the multiplication of the red blood cells in the bone marrow, in the red bone marrow, because you already know the red blood cells outside of the rebel marrow, they lost the nucleus, so they cannot divide anymore. They lose the nucleus, including the DNA. And because of this, the red blood cells, when they are in the bloodstream, they cannot reproduce. Live 120 days, and they die in the spleen, and actually that is the end of the red blood cells. So what is doing vitamin B9 and B12? They are going to work in the red bone marrow to promote, promote cell division of the red blood cells. You know that we need, we need, we need what? We need, we have actually, we produce 2 million new red blood cells per second. So it's a lot, a huge amount. So basically they need vitamin B9 and B12. B9 and B12. B9 is folic acid, folate, and the vitamin B12, okay? All right, so now these are going to be needed for cell division. Cell division, where in the red bone marrow. That is where they are going to be needed, vitamin B12 and B9. So now the cell division stops before the final step of a mature red blood cell. So that is going to let tell you that when they are coming out without having the... Um, the maturity of the red blood cells, the red blood cells, when they come out from the red bone marrow caused by deficiency of vitamin B9 and 12, the red blood cells are, this is normal red blood cell size, the, no, the, the deficiency of, of these vitamins are going to make a big red blood cell that is actually called a, megalo, a megaloblast. There you are, megaloblast, megaloblast, megaloblast. These megaloblasts are, are, are actually called the megaloblastic anemia, megaloblastic anemia. So that you can see in the microscope. This megaloblastic anemia, this megaloblastic anemia is consequence of vitamin B9 and B12. How we check that? With a microscope. Now, you already know that deficiency of iron produce microcytic microcytic hypochromic anemia, and the vitamin B12 and B9 cause the megaloblastic anemia. Be okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so rich foods on folic acid are going to be basically the uh, dark green leaf vegetables, like the chard, like the spinach, and the other one, what is that? Chard, spinach, I forget always the name. And uh, what is the other green leaf? Spinach chart and um, 
Is it kale? Kale, excellent. Kale. Kale is very nice. A little bit bitter, but nice. Okay. But, but you put it with some strawberries, some, no, some um, cranberries. Very nice. Okay, anyhow. So that is vitamin B9 and B12. All right. So uh, that is basically that. All right. So now we are going to talk about what is normal. What, what is happening in, I will say normal, because there's some changes. As you know, a, a adult is not the same when they get older. There's some changes when you are getting older. And for this, we have the stomach here. All right, so the stomach, the stomach are going to have different components, right? So we already know that this is the mucosa, mucosa that is the inner lining, inner lining of the stomach. This is the mucosa, 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 mucosa. This is the wall. The, the other one is the wall of the of the stomach that are going to contain muscle and etc. Right? But the, here the lining that is the mucosa, 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 mucosa. This mucosa contains cells. This mucosa have cells. We have the cheat cells, parietal cells, we have enterochromaffin, we have many cells. These cells that are located here are the ones who produce gastric acid. Gastric acid. If you want to know, it are the parietal cells. I'm not going to ask that. Parietal cells, this is a type of cells who produce this gastric acid. What is the gastric acid? The chlorhydric acid, chlorhydric acid, acid. That is the HCl, HCl. H is uh, is acid, right? So they are going to produce the HCl here. They are going to produce HCl. They are going to produce HCl. All right. So that is the gastric acid, and you remember the pH of the stomach is two. Remember, it sounds awful, but a stomach, just to remember, right? A stomach, a stomach, okay? So that is pH 2, just to remember. Now, this gastric acid are going to need it for a reason. The reason for gastric acid is going to be the, uh, they're going to help the iron. This is the iron. The iron is going to get attached to the, uh, to the gastric acid, and this union or this fusion are going to make the iron able to be absorbed by the, by the intestine. So that is how the iron is going to be absorbed. The iron needs gastric acid. Remember that. So the iron needs gastric acid, acidity, in order to be absorbed by the intestine. Is that clear? Yes. Yep. Okay. So now, Mar uh, Marcel, you you already told me that elderly people, this, this person who is having uh, anemia, are having basically the old, this old person, right? Or elderly, right? So why is that? Why? Because elderly people, elderly people do not produce as much gastric acid when you are adult. So when you are elderly, elderly, you produce less gastric acid. And you have, if you have, for that reason, if you have less gastric acid, the absorption of iron is going to be diminished. Is that clear or no? It's clear. Clear here. Okay. So now, how we can, this is nursing interventions already, nursing considerations. So if you know the cause, this iron, no anything else, but this iron, iron, that is the deficiency, how you can improve the absorption of iron in elderly people. You can improve the absorption of iron in elderly people when you take iron supplements, iron supplements with orange juice, with orange juice, NCLEX, orange juice, orange juice. Why orange juice? 
because the orange juice is acid. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So now you know how they are going. We are going to talk about elixirs uh, next time in pharmacology. This is another way to do it. But basically, uh, I, I I don't want to give uh, excess of information. So just what we need for this class. Okay. So we okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about the vitamin B9 especially the vitamin b12 the vitamin b12 the vitamin b12 in order to be absorbed so we have one the mucosa that you already know the mucosa have another cells enterochromaffin that are going to produce a substance that is called the intrinsic factor intrinsic factor question for the exam this intrinsic factor what it is so please don't get confused intrinsic factor is not gastric acid intrinsic factor is not is no it's not gastric acid it's not hcl intrinsic factor is a glycoprotein i'm going to put protein just to make it protein it's a protein it's a type of protein this type of protein is produced by the mucosa of the stomach and what is needed this intrinsic factor in order to attach to the vitamin b12 and attach the intrinsic factor to the vitamin b12 that is going to make actually the absorption of the vitamin b12 in the intestine you okay with that yep all right so we have intrinsic factor and gastric acid and, and vitamin b9 is needed too as well for intrinsic factor so but the most important is the vitamin b12 all right so for this we are going to go here this is actually the lack of intrinsic factor is called that per oh by the way and guess what in elderly people we do not produce or they i'm not every year they do they do not produce intrinsic factor as when you were adult or young younger so there is two things that happen in elderly people low levels of gastric acid low production of gastric acid and low production of intrinsic factor we call the if intrinsic factor so there is one disease that is called the pernicious anemia pernicious anemia coming for open eyes open ears coming for the exam pernicious anemia what is the pernicious anemia pernicious anemia is an autoimmune disorder so that means that your own body destroy the cells who produce the intrinsic factor in the stomach that can happen in young people as well Right, but this autoimmune disorder are going to destroy those cells who are going to produce the intrinsic factor, leading in what we call the pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia. Okay, so what happened? The number of cells on the mucosa of the stomach are going to disappear, com not completely, partially, but they are going to have less intrinsic factor, means less absorption of vitamin B12. Okay, another situation that can happen the uh, anemia by iron and vitamin b uh, vitamin b12 is that gastrectomy gastrectomy if you re gastrectomy means gastro means stomach ectomy means resection so the the resection of the stomach obviously there is no cells to produce intrinsic factor or gastric acid so you have in this resection removal of the stomach for whatever reason ulcers traumas whatever you don't have a stomach the stomach do not produce the intrinsic factor no absorption of vitamin b12 no production of gastric acid no absorption of iron so you will have a combination of problems you have a megaloblastic anemia and at the same time some microcytic hypochromic anemia okay the deficiency yeah. of vitamin e vitamin e is uh, is actually an antioxidant antioxidant i think about 
this uh, antioxidant like a broom, a broom. And what is the dust? The dust are going to be the free radicals. So this broom is the vitamin E. And the vitamin E deficiency, what is going to uh, uh, happen is that there is no broom to get rid of the free radicals who are attached to the walls of the red blood cells. And that produces, at the end, destruction of the red blood cells, uh, leading into hemolysis. Okay, do you get with that? Yes. Okay, so that is about this is the this is the mucosa of the stomach. There go. This is the pH of the of the stomach. Here is the uh, the mucus mucus. So please don't get confused. This is the mucosa, and this is the mucus. The mucus is a barrier. This is a barrier between this. This is the barrier between the gastric acid and the mucosa. So these mucosa are going to produce mucus. Remember, we have the pseudostratified epithelium in the in the respiratory tract that produces the mucus. Similar thing happen in the stomach. So these mucus are the barrier to protect because the pH two. If they actually the mucus, this mucus is going to thinner, they can be in contact with the mucosa producing an ulcer. Okay. You okay with that? All right. Yep. All right, excellent. So we are talking about malaria. This is the mosquito. The form of standing up of the mosquito, this is a female. The male is more horizontal. So I already we, we will talk about that later. But malaria, malaria is a protozoa. There you are the name, Plasmodium vivax. We have Plasmodium vivax, ovale, falciparum, many other types. This is a family. This Plasmodium, what is doing is a protozoa. It's a proto I'm going to draw a Plasmodium. Plasmodium is like this. That is a Plasmodium. And where they live, they live here in the GI tract of the of the mosquito. Yes, in the GI tract, the mosquito, they have esophagus, they have a stomach, they have a, a small, large intestine. That is where the plasmodium live. So this, when the mosquito is going to put the needle in order to draw blood, they spit on you. They spit on you. They spit is saliva because they have salivary glands too. In that saliva, that this part of the GI tract is where the plasmodium is going to get in. When they put a needle, it's like they are putting the plasmodium inside your body. And that's how malaria is going to be. Why is important to know that? It's important for NCLEX. Why? Because who causes malaria? Who causes malaria is not the mosquito. The cause of malaria is going to be the plasmodium the protozoa, a, a mosquito, what he's doing is the transportation is going to carry, is going to be, is going to carry the plasmodium. So it's the way of transmission. So the mosquito, mosquito is that transmission and the plasmodium is the cause of the malaria. Are you okay with that? Yeah. yeah. Malaria is important to know why, because they, uh, they, this is the number one cause of death in, the, in, in all the world. Around the world, we have, I, I, again, one million every year, every year from, from forever, even more. So one year of actually people who are dying from malaria. So how many people die in the United States for COVID-19? How many do you somebody remember? It's about at this moment I think there's like almost more than two million. But anyhow, all right. So but this is happening every single year. Every single one year, one one million, one million, one million. All right, so this uh, when the red blood cells are being destroyed, when the red blood cells are being destroyed. When the red blood cells are being destroyed, they are going to produce actually substance that increase are called pyrogens. These pyrogens are going to go to the hypothalamus to increase the temperature. 
So the red blood cells have been destroyed and they send messages to the, to the, to the brain and the brain are going to make actually increase the temperature of the body. So that is basically what we call paroxysmal attack of fever. Paroxy, paroxysmal, paroxysmal, or correct me, paroxysmal attack. So paroxysmal means suddenly, all of the sudden, all of the sudden, all of the sudden. So you start to shake like crazy. You start to have a lot of shakiness, all your body. That is all of the sudden. Right now, I'm okay. In the next 10 seconds, I start to shake like crazy. That is all of the sudden, paroxysmal attack of fever, fever, okay? You okay with that? Yeah. yeah. All right, so sickle cell disease are going to be, uh, that is a part of evolution. In Africa, where we're having the most of the deaths of malaria, some people get immune resistant to the malaria, to the disease. And that is because they make some changes on the cell membrane that do not allow the protozoa, plasmodium vivax, get into the cell. Thus, those changes are happening by evolution, by adaptation of the situation, and some changes or mutations on the genes. But these genes that are going to make some proteins that are no lack of protein that do not allow the plasmodium get into the red blood cells, but what is making the the, the walls, the cell membrane of the of the red blood cell become weaker. You are resistant to the malaria, but your red blood cells become weaker having this sickle cell disease. They're going to have this shape and they're going to rupture at the level of the capillaries producing hemolysis. The rest, don't worry about that. Chromosome 11, if you want to remember, but I'm not going to go on that uh, equation for the exam. Okay? Okay, so now let's complete the story of the red blood cells. Okay, so what happened normally? What happened normally? You have the red blood cells. They are going to, uh, okay, I'm going to do this. This is the red blood cell, normal red blood cell. Oh, yes, give me a second, please. Give me a second. Please, sorry for that. Okay, go, go, go. Okay. Okay. All right, so we have the red blood cell here, and the red blood cell is going to have an span life of 120 days. All these dots you see here are going to be the 24,000 24,000 24,000 molecules of hemoglobin. Okay? You okay with that? All right. So now, these 120 days of the red blood cells are going to have 120 days. And when they have 120 days, they are going to die in the spleen. This is the spleen. The spleen. This is the spleen. All right? So here we have the red blood cells are going to blow up, are going to blow up and releasing the hemoglobin, are going to release the hemoglobin. Millions and I would say billions of red blood cells are going to be destroyed every second. Now these dots, the hemoglobin that are being released, they are going to go to the bloodstream, to the bloodstream. So we have here hemoglobin, hemoglobin, hemoglobin that we release from the destruction of the red blood cells. These hemoglobins are going to be in combination with water of the plasma on the red blood cells. 
and that is going to turn into Billy Ruby. Billy Ruby. This Billy Ruby is a pigment. It's a, a yellowish, yellowish, greenish uh, color. This Billy Ruby, this Billy Ruby that is floating in the bloodstream, is in the bloodstream, in the bloodstream. All these bilirubin coming from the destruction of the red blood cells are going to be captured by the liver. The liver. The liver is going to take the bilirubin. All right. Okay. Taking bilirubin. So remember what are the functions of the liver. 512 functions, you need to remember four of them. A, B, C, and D. A, for the liver produce albumin. C, produce the coagulation factors that at the end produce the fibrin. Where is coming the fibrin from? From the liver. And D, the detoxification, ammonia into urea. We are going to focus here in the B. B doesn't mean, uh, bio but you can use for billy ruin too so why because the liver is again is the bartender it's a bartender bartender that produce bile bile the bile what is bile bile is going to be cholesterol plus uh, bile acids plus water plus electrolytes, lecithin, I'm not going to add that, plus bilirubin. So the bartender are going to actually make a cocktail called bile, and you need one, two, three, four, five, six ingredients. One of these ingredients is the bilirubin. So in order to deliver produce the bile, the bilirubin is going to be captured by the liver. It's going to be captured by the liver in order to make the liver, the bartender, to create the bile. So the bile then go to the gallbladder. Go to the gallbladder. And actually from the gallbladder, they are going to release the bile into the intestines. Remember that the duodenum is the one who received the bile. Right, so many functions, the bile acid for emulsification of the fat, we talked about in the past. They are going to release the bilirubin to, into the intestines. Okay, this pigment, this pigment, this pigment are going to imagine that is already in the intestine. The pigment that is in the intestine are going to, uh, most, uh, most uh, no, the bilirubin will be that is coming from the bile into the intestine, that pigment are going to go into the large intestine. They are going to go all the way to be excreted. And that's why your stools, your poo-poo, are going to be yellow. Miss O, are you listening to me? Miss O, are you okay? Yes. Okay, so that's why your stools are yellow. Brown, yellow, but that, so homework. You're going to see that, and you get this, oh, Billy Ruby. That is Billy Ruby, all right? So some Billy Ruby are going to be excreted through the feces. Another portion of the Billy Ruby that, is, are, that are in the intestines are going to go into, they are going to be absorbed by the intestines again. When the Billy Ruby is being absorbed by the intestines, go to the blood. And then the blood is going to be filtered by the kidneys. And the bilirubin is excreted in the urine. So that's why your urine is yellow. You okay with that? So why your why is your uh, uh, bilirubin, why your urine is uh, yellow? Is because the bilirubin. Homework. Urine is yellow. Oh, my urine is yellow. Oh. Bilirubin, bilirubin. 
But Eric is thinking about why my pee is white sometimes. Right? You're thinking that, right? Right? So why my pee is white? Because you have excess of water. Bilirubin is still there, but it's a very tiny amount because it's very diluted by the water. So that's why the, the urine looks like it's more clear. You okay with that? Yeah. Dr. G. Yes, Marilu. Um, I just want to make sure I have the breakdown um, well. So it's um, the hemoglobin plus water is the bilirubin, then it'll go to the liver, and then the liver captures it, and then go, form the body. Exactly. Okay. Some bilirubin will be excreted and some bilirubin will be absorbed. The one who is excreted go to the feces, the one who is absorbed is filtrated and eliminated through the kit. You okay with that? Okay. Yes. So now look at this. Look at this. Now let's go to pathology. What happened when you have jandish? What is jandish? Mm -hmm. Um, it's indicator that the kid or the liver is failing, but you turn yellow, your skin and your eyes turn yellow. Very good. That is part of that. All right. I will tell you. Tell me, let's suppose that the liver is working nice. The liver is not a problem. Okay. So this, she said very well, this, when the liver is not working, have liver failure, cirrhosis, right? So the liver is not working. So the liver cannot capture the bile, the sorry, the bilirubin from the blood. They cannot capture it because the liver is failing. So bilirubin starts to accumulate in the blood and they go to all the vessels, all the capillaries, even under the skin. And the pigment are going to start going into the skin and your skin becomes ye uh, yellow. That's called jandish. You get with that? But there is another cause, I mean, it's Marcel. Let's suppose, and you can tell me now, tell me, you can, I see you have the idea. No, no, okay, okay. All right, so when the liver is working properly, very nice, there is no problem about the, 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 the liver. Everything is working fine. But what happened if the liver, what is doing is to capture baby Ruby, correct? You okay with that? Correct. What happened if you have emoly uh, hemolysis? What happened that you, from above the normal death of the red blood cells, you have many more dead red blood cells. So you have huge amount of hemoglobin that are going to turn the huge amount of bilirubin. And this huge amount of bilirubin is going to be overpassing the ability of the liver to capture the bilirubin because it's too much. So again, the bilirubin starts to accumulate into the bloodstream and produce jaundice. So it could be for two reasons, for hemolysis of the red blood cells or for liver failure. You okay with that? Yep. So it's not just for the liver failure. It can be for hemolysis of the red blood cell. Okay? Uh, uh, okay. You have babies, right? You have babies before? Marcel, you know. Marilu? Oh, you have a baby, you have kids before? All right. So you, okay. So don't, don't answer me. So do you notice when the baby is just born, become yellow? Yes, uh, my, my two kids have. Jandice, right? That yeah. is normal? No, that is totally normal. So why are I going to tell you? How is that explainable? Look at this. The fetus, when this fetus, we have a hemoglobin that is called the fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin. And when we're adult, we have the adult hemoglobin. You, you and I, we have the adult hemoglobin. But the fetus, the fetus means inside the uterus, they have a different a slightly different type of hemoglobin. This is called the fetal hemoglobin. This fetal hemoglobin is normal. 
is actually the properties is that capture the oxygen much better than the adult hemoglobin. That is one. Second, when the baby is born, the supply of oxygen are going to be plenty through the through the lungs, right? So they don't need any more that hemoglobin, the fetal hemoglobin. And they are going to make the transition be, between the fetal hemoglobin into the adult hemoglobin. And in order to happen that, all the hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin, need to be destroyed and replaced by the adult. That huge destruction of the fetal hemoglobin is the one who produces the, the jaundice in the newborn. OK? Is that clear or not? Now, the jaundice is, jaundice is going to happen normally after three days of their born, no other moment that they born, after three days. And that is called the physiological jaundice. Physiological means normal, normal jaundice, and happen during seven days and then disappear. The game is all. Yes, but um, the younger one, uh, he, he has to exchange the blood. She has to exchange the blood on the time. They need they need to change because the hemoglobin, no the blood, the hemoglobin. No blood, blood exchange. Because um the doctor said it is higher uh what it is higher amount of um the uh, globumin. What? Hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin. Not 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 hemoglobin, the other one, the yellow one. Bilirubin. Bilirubin, yes. Yeah, this will be Ruby. The younger, the younger, yeah. What they did? They did blood transfusion or something? I don't uh, so. It is blood transfusion, uh, but but I what I understand what I understand is blood exchange. They they, they did the blood exchange. That, yeah, that is a that is another yeah that's a correct. It's the blood exchange exchange from what from the fetal hemoglobin to the adult hemoglobin. Yes, yes. Okay. It's not yes. like the fetal hemoglobin are going to be converted into adult. No. The mm -hmm. fetal hemoglobin need to be destroyed in order to replace mm -hmm. by new bilirubin. Oh, I see. Okay? Okay. We okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So now let's continue. Okay. So here we have it's called jandish, right? It's going to be jandish. Uh, all right. Uh, tissue damage. Oh, okay, okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so jandish. So for this, I need to tell you a few things that are going to be very useful. Jandish is the same to say icterisha. 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 When the jaundice is severe, icterisia or jaundice, that is going to lead you into kernicterus. Kernicterus. These are going to write it on kernicterus. That is a severe jaundice. That is going to basically get attached to the brain and that can lead into seizures coma and death that is very important carnicles carnicles get impregnated in the in the tissue in the uncus on the temporal uh, lobe and that can produce seizures coma and death okay icterisha you okay with that Kernicterus, don't forget about that, Kernicterus, okay? Okay, please, please. What, what exactly is it? Is it a protein? Is it a, like how? Is, is it? a pigment. Yeah, it's basically based on proteins, yes. Remember that the bilirubin is like the, the degradation of the hemoglobin hem and globin so are going to be part remnants of 
proteins and part of, uh, I would say, a, a, well, I don't want to mention porphyrins, that is the components of the hemoglobin. But all these waste of the, of the hemoglobin uh, degeneration are going to be basically a protein, yes. Okay? Yep, we got it. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So now, this hemolysis is, is okay, uh, anemia, oh, we can wait, we can wait, we can wait, uh, we can wait, and that actually, anemia, just don't do anything, just until you treat. No, that can produce organ and damage. Organ and damage. Why is that? Look at this. When you destroy in huge amounts the red blood cells, these red blood cells are going to actually produce a lot of release of these uh, uh, pigments and proteins coming from the hemoglobin. And what happened, that is going to be like, like what, uh, the clear water of the blood, clear water. So let's imagine that the, the blood is like a clear water and you put a lot of soil on the water, a lot, a lot. And what is going to be? It's going to be mud, M-U-D, right? Like a mud. So this is going to be a very thick blood. And what happened with this is going to basically obstruct, block the glomerular filtration that we talked in the past. So the kidneys are going to be basically totally flooded with mud. That is basically the uh, uh, bilirubin, the hemoglobin, the, the hemoglobin degradation, the hemoglobin degradation produce waste products that are going to block the glomerular filtration. And that can lead into kidney failure. Kidney failure. You okay with that? Now, the same thing with the sickle cell disease. Sickle cell are weak cell membranes, and they are going to be destroyed massively, a lot. And that can block not only the kidney, but they can block other areas of the body, especially at the level of the capillaries. Because the mud, the, the blood becomes so thicker that the capillaries is like a stack with, with mud. And that can lead in, for example, in the retina, in the retina, the capillaries are going to be totally blocked as well. And the retina start to be destroyed because there is no blood to blood and you become blind. Blindness, very common to see that in malaria. Okay, we got it? So the consequence of hemoly hemolysis is not just a destruction, it's going to have consequences. They're going to block the end of vessels in different organs. You can have even a stroke. You can have kidney failure. You can be blindness. You can have you have ischemia of the of the colon of the intestine, so anything can be blocked by this hemolysis. Okay. Is dialysis the effective treatment for the renal failure caused by the? Oh, renal failure. Yeah. Basically, is uh, uh, in this case what they are going to do is hydrate the patient and dialysis. And that will be resolved, could be resolved a problem. If there is a blockage, we need to force with diuretics. We force diuretics, and that is going to make the glomerular filtration happen. The pores are going to open, and more vasodilation, more blood. It's like you push, it's like you have your toilet, <laughs> your toilet is blocked. What are you using? This, how do you call this? How do you call plunger. that? Plunger, right? Plunger, yeah. That is about, so we we force the releases and that is going to get uh, actually release or clear up the path. <clears throat> okay? Now, let's go to the clinical. The clinical is NCLEX, HESI, so please pay attention. It's telling you where, uh, 
how you detect jaundice in a person. You have a yellowish, yellowish decoloration of the of the of, on the person. Where is the first? Where is the number one place where you can see jaundice or icteritia? The number one place for NCLEX and HESI and all, all the tests are going to be here. So put, put, put your finger here and pull it down. Can you do that for me? There you are. And look inside, see? All right, so that is where you see the first time the jaundice. How do you know it's yellow? Go to the mirror and look at yourself. Look at yourself, oh, this is normal and go to the patient and you will see the difference. You are normal. You, can, you are a parameter of comparison. So number one is, go, is called the subconjunctival sac. In the subconjunctival sac. So I'm going to write it out. Is in the, in the eye, you're going to see in the pull down, the lower eyelid, and you will see the subconjunctival sac pull down the eyelid the lower eyelid and look the subconjunctival sac that is a lot of vessels and that is where you see number one the jumps or ectericia okay number two question for anklets after the subconjunctival sac the second place for anklets is going to be the skin the skin so for it, that is important, why? Because if you see the patient uh, yellowish, yellowish, you see the skin is already, to confirm, if you confirm, you need to see here, the subconjunctive is yellow, that is jaundice. Be careful with that. But I'm going to give you a tip that is not in the books, that is not in NCLEX, they don't answer that. In reality, the first place that you can see before the skin, before the eyes oh by the way it's not a subconjective sac is and subconjective sac and a sclera i need to i need to clarify that the sclera the sclera and the subconjective sac but you pull down here you will see yellow and the sclera the sclera is the white part of the eye you okay with that okay yeah. now before the before the skin before the sclera you're going to do this. You're going to ask the patient to open the mouth and, up, and put up the tongue. Under the tongue is earlier than the skin and early than the eyes. Under the tongue. That is where you see, you, see, you, you open the mouth, open it, oh my God, my eyes are so bright. So that, that is a sensation. That actually you will see yellowish under the tongue. That is first even before the skin before the eyes you okay with that they're not going yeah. to ask you in inklex huh? that in inklex i don't know why they said uh, sclera first and skin but i'm telling you because of the well i have patients many patients in the past all right so let's keep moving hemorrhagic anemia Hemorrhagic anemia is the blood loss, right? So you have a rupture of the vessels and they're going to have this uh, loss of blood, loss of red blood cells as well. So internal hemorrhage and inter external hemorrhage. The external hemorrhage is what you see, bleeding, right? Uh, internal hemorrhage could be in, inside the compartments of the leg between the muscles. You see a swollen leg because there is a lot of accumulation of blood there. Or actually in the abdomen or in the thorax. So you're losing blood in that. Okay, so that is the internal hemorrhage. In both cases, internal or external, you're using your classification of class one, two, three, four hemorrhage, uh, hemor hemorrhage uh, uh, stages, right? So class, classes. So just remember, when you have class one, there is no signs and symptoms are exactly normal, but you at least you're losing less than one liter of blood, one bottle. Class two, you're losing 
more than one bottle, two at least two bo two bottles of of, of what of um, of blood. That is where you start to have changes of the signs and symptoms. How is going to be? Remember, less blood, you increase your heart rate. Remember, we was talking about that. So you already know why the heart rate is going up because they want to distribute efficiently as possible the oxygen that is basically uh, carried by the red blood cells. Less red blood cells because you're losing blood, the heart rate starts to increase. Okay? All right, so let's talk. I have seven minutes for the uh, blood types, and I'm going to be very short on this. So what are the serotypes? The serotypes, serotypes are going to be, here we have serotype A. This is the red blood cell. Serotype B. This is the red blood cell. Serotype AB. This is the red blood cell. And serotype O. This is the, cell, the red blood cell. What is the serotype a, B, A, B, O. So A, B, A, B, A, B are proteins. Proteins are proteins, proteins. Where are those proteins? The A are, all these proteins are located in the surface of the cell, of the red blood cell, on the surface, on the surface of the red blood cell. This is A, just to give you a shape of the protein, right? Let's go B. B are like this. Serotype B. Serotype AB. You have A and you have B. A and B. Okay? And O, O means zero. Means none. So you don't have any protein in the surface. You okay with that? All right. So the serotype A, you know that if you have, your body have proteins and your body know, let's make it simple because we didn't do immunology yet. So I'm going to try to translate in very simple words. The, the body are going, the body knows your own body. Let's put it that way. So your body knows what are belonging to your body itself, to your body. Now, if there's something that is coming different to your body, the body is going to understand or uh, interpret this like somebody is trying to attack you because any stranger will be your enemy. So you are happy with your body. So that's the, the immune system knows what cells belong to your eye, to your nails, to your liver, to your pancreas, to your stomach, to everything. So all our friends. But if somebody is coming different, does the body, what it's doing is to try to destroy that new individual called enemy. So if you have serotype A, if you have serotype, serotype A, so your body knows only the protein A. But if you give blood, if you are losing blood here, the patient A is losing blood, and you give uh, 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 blood serotype B, this protein for A is a stranger, it's an enemy. So what is doing the body? The body is trying to destroy the, the blood that is coming as from the donor. So this is the recipient, the recipient, this is the recipient, and here, this is the donor. So in this case, B cannot give to A because B is a protein that the recipient do not recognize as their own. Now, AB cannot give as well to A, why? Because A is the same protein. Yes, okay, welcome, the, vita, the protein A. But they contain B. So A cannot receive from B. 
A, B, and they cannot receive from they cannot receive from B, and they cannot receive from A, B. Is that clear or no? Yeah. But A can receive from O, yes or no? Yes. 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 Because it's not giving any protein that is nothing. So actually, O can give to A. You okay with that? So A can receive from what? A can receive only from A, from A, and receive from O. Is that clear? Yep. Tell me, B can receive from, from, B can receive from, B can give to B? Yep. Yes. A can give to A, no. to B, sorry? No. A, B can give to B? No. No. Because even though B is the same, but A is different. B can receive from O. Yeah. Yes. Tell me, A, B can receive from A, yes or no? Yes. Yes. B can give to A, yes. to A B, yes or no? A, B can yes. receive from A, B, yes or no? And yes. A, B can receive from O? Yes. Yes. Now, tell me, can O receive from A? A can give to O or no? Huh? No. A can give to O, yes or no? No. No. B no. can I give to no. O. No. A B can give to O. No. O can give to O. Yes. Yes. So now, if you have, if you have here, look at this. O can give to A B. O can give to B. O can give to A. Okay. So O. O is going to be the universal donor. So O can give to everybody. You okay with that? And yes. I, A, B is the universal recipient. So they can actually receive from all of them. A, B can receive from A? Yes. Can receive from B? Yes. From A, B? Yes. Can receive from O? Yes. O can give to A? Yes. Can give to B? Yes. Can give to A, B? Yes. Can B give to O? Yes. Do you get with that? So as a conclusion, so that's why you need to know your blood serotype. O because you're going to receive or because you're going to be a donor. So either way, you must know when you go to the doctor next time, you want to ask your serotype. If they ask you why you want to your serotype, because I want to know, okay? Okay? You got it? Yes. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the resource factor. Hopefully, I have time for always. All right. All right, so here we have, we are going to talk about the R, R, uh, RH factor. All right, so RH factor. So RH factor, RH factor, what is this? is a protein again. Where is located? In the on the cell on the cell membrane. This protein when you are when you have the protein 
this Rh protein in your cell membrane that is Rh positive. When you don't have this protein, it's going to be it's Rh like this. It's going to be Rh negative. So the majority are going to be 85% of the people are going to be Rh positive. Only 15 to 25 percent, 15 to 25 percent are going to be Rh negative. So, for example, if you are serotype A, you can have A positive or A negative. You can be B positive or you can be B negative. You can be AB positive or you can have AB negative. Or you can have O positive and you are going to, or you can have O negative. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the average factor, average factor is the RH factor, is coming from the word the resus factor. This resus factor, resus, actually is coming from the from the when uh, the where, where was discovered. That was a monkey. A monkey in the monkey they discovered this protein in the red blood cells. That was where the first time was discovered this protein. Then they find out that all human, well not human, most of the humans we have some. Uh, 15 to 25 percent of the humans has this factor. Okay with that? So you cannot give, you cannot give O positive to O negative because you are giving you are, because you are giving that protein that the other person doesn't have. So if you need to give, if you are O negative, you need to receive basically O negative. That's all what you need. If you have A negative, you need to receive A negative or O negative. If you have B negative, you can receive from B negative or O negative. If you have AB negative, you can receive only from O negative or AB negative. If you have O negative, you can receive only from O negative. You okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. So now, talking about this, they want to talk about. Let me see this. Is the word erythroblastosis fetalis? Okay. So I'm not going to do. Oh, there's erythroblastosis fetalis. Ah. Okay. So let's talk about erythroblastosis fetalis. Hopefully, we have time to do all this. All right. So we have the erythroblastosis fetalis. Erythroblast. It's the ugly name, right? Fetalis. This is the mother, the mother who is RH negative. Okay? So these mothers actually remember we have 85% are going to be RH positive. And 15% to 25% are going to be RH negative. You okay with that? All right. Now, number one, mother and fetus, mother have their own blood flow, own, own red blood cells. And the fetus, they have the own, his, his own or her own red blood cells. So the mother and the fetus do not mix blood. Do not mix blood during pregnancy. Mother neonate uh, born, just born mix they yes they mix blood during delivery. 
because of rupture of membranes, etc., they are going to mix two mLs of blood. That's all what they mix. At the moment of delivery. At the moment of delivery. Okay, you follow me? All right. Number three. If the mother is RH negative, the pregnancy is going to be normal. Tell me, the, the fetus or the neonates, what type of RH is going to be most likely, positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Why? Because I told you, and we was telling that the majority of the people is 85% are going to be RH positive. So most likely the baby is going to be RH positive. So during the pregnancy, there is no mix of blood. So there is no problem during the pregnancy. The problem is going to happen during the delivery where two mLs, 40 drops of blood are going to be mixed with the mother. And if the mother is Rh negative, they are going to mix with the Rh positive. The mother are never, never saw this type of protein. So the mother blood system, immune system is going to see that it's an enemy. So they are going to destroy the red blood cells. And that is called the erythro red blood cell blastosis fetalis. That is going to basically die the mother and the fetus. So in the past, in the past there was no laboratory test, like well, 60, 70 years ago. There was no laboratory test for that. So, but, but uh, uh, actually um, the system was not arriving to everyone. But anyhow, so what happened is this, that this mother, listen, this is very important, okay? The mother, when was pregnant for the first time, I said first time, the immune system was not prepared. If he, if the mother is Rh negative and the baby was Rh positive, the first pregnancy, the immune system of the mother was not prepared to attack the, the strangers. So there are going to be some reaction, but the mother most likely survived and the fetus survived. The first pregnancy, and that's it. Because after that, if they have a second pregnancy, the immune system of the mother that was exposed in the past with that protein is ready with all the tanks, all the battery, all the missiles, actually ready to waiting for the enemy if that enemy appears again. Is in the second pregnancy where the mother are going to have problems and the fit and the fit. And that is what we call the erythroblastosis fetalis. You okay with that? Nowadays, our, we have treatment for that. The treatment, the treatment. So now the question is, if the mother is it's negative, can he give birth more than one time? The answer is yes, because there is a treatment. The treatment is called the ROGAM, R-H-O-M-A. Rogan, Rogan, Rogan. So what is doing this is basically they are going. This is, for example, the uh, the Rh positive of the fetus. And what happened to Rogan? Rogan is going to basically hide. They are going to hide, like putting like a hat on the top, in order not to be recognized by the mother cells, immune system. Rogan. Okay, 50 milligrams, 28 weeks after delivery, another 50 intramuscular. Okay, so that is the role. You okay with that? Yep. Yep. Okay, so let's go to muscles. All right, so the muscles, we have about 610 muscles. We have all muscles everywhere. Okay, the muscles, the muscles are going to, the muscles are going to have three categories, as you already know. We have the voluntary muscle. Question for the exam. 
or call the skeletal muscle because they are attached to the bones or call or call the other one the striated muscle because they have the striations this voluntary muscle is everything move whatever muscle you want whatever muscle you want that is a striated muscle voluntary muscle or skeletal muscle the other one is the involuntary muscle or call the smooth muscle why is called a smooth muscle because they do not have the straight straight structures the straight muscle are going to be cylindrical like this with striations what are those striations those are proteins in the smooth muscle we don't have this striation proteins are going to be dispersed all over so that is a smooth muscle involuntary muscle involuntary muscle will be your stomach your gallbladder your urinary bladder the bile ducts arteries and veins they contain a smooth muscle arteries and veins contains a smooth muscle okay and the other muscle is the cardiac muscle the cardiac muscle are going to be more like rectangular and they have some few few stri striations all right based on that we are going to talk about the muscle itself okay so please this is coming for the exam this is the muscle all this is the muscle 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 all this is the muscle now uh, uh, let me see if i can do a different way Okay, let's suppose, let's, let's suppose this. this is something I do in the classroom. Uh, so, but we are in the classroom, I try to do something similar. So let's suppose that this is the classroom and you are here. This is you, 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 you. Another row of students here, you, 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 you. Another you, you, you. And let's play again. Number one. Okay, so uh, before that, yeah, I'm going to keep that. So, uh, what is the the uh, what are the we have? Can you see these fibers here? Yeah. So, including this, huh? All this white, all this is all this is one cell. These cells are going to be long, of course, like this, right? It's just a cross section. So these are called muscle cell or fiber, or called muscle fiber. Fiber, it's like a fiber, 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 like small spaghetti, 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 spaghetti. I should bring a spaghetti. Okay, spaghetti. So each of the, that is the cell of the muscle. So one cell of the muscle is the same to say a fiber. We give you that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now, this uh, uh, these fibers are when they get in together like this, together like this, it's like you have several pencils. Take several pencils and put it together. Each pencil is going to be a fiber or muscle cell, but the group of pencils that you have in your in your hand together are going to be called a fascicle so this is a fascicle that is showing you one muscle fiber here a group a group of fibers are going to form a fascicle you okay with that yep. now how many fascicles we have here one two three four five six fascicles right these fascicles together are going to form what we call a muscle So we have three stops, the muscle fiber, 
group of muscle fibers are going to be called fascicles. And the group of fascicles are going to be called the muscle. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for that, something else I want to say. Okay. Uh, for each fascicle, for each fascicle, we have approximately 30 to 60 fibers. So 30 to 60 fibers, 30 to 60, 30 to 60 pencils together are going to create a form a fascicle. We have about a thousand of fascicles, around 1,000 to 5,000 fascicles in each muscle. It's a lot. Okay? All right. So, but now that is not the uh, uh, the the end. We need to talk more about this. Okay. So for this, I'm going to go to this slide. All right. So which one? What is each one? Each one is a fiber, correct? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. And all together here all together, all together is going to be a fascicle, correct? Yes. Correct. Okay, that is a fascicle. And all fascicles are going to be called muscle, correct? Correct. All right, so now look at this. Here, we are going to see that there is a membrane that is going to cover each fiber. Each fiber is going to be like a plastic bag, like wrap up plastic. Each fiber, each fiber. So it's just me, sorry. I need to do it. Each fiber are going to be having a membrane. This membrane is called the Endomysium. Endomysium. Okay? Yeah. We have another fiber. This another fiber, an, another, so another membrane. This membrane is going to surround all these fibers. And this membrane is going to form what they call a fascicle. This membrane is called a perimysium. Perimysium. And we have another membrane that is going, so uh, just a moment. We have here a fascicle here, another fascicle here. This yellow membrane is called the perimysium. But we have another membrane that is going to surround all the fascicles. This membrane is called the epimysium. Epimysium. We have endomysium, the inner covering the fiber, forming the fascicle, the perimysium, and we have the other, the outer, outer layer around the muscle, it's called the epimysium. The, if you like lamb, if you gonna like lamb, the lamb, they have a very thick epimysium. So this membrane that is on the top of the lamb, that is epimysium, okay? Sorry. Let's go to the graphic. All right, so here we have the fiber, number one. Then we have the endomysium, a group of fibers. And we have the muscle, that is the group of fascicles. So each fiber is going to be covered by what we call the endomysium. So this white is going to be the endomysium. Endomysium. 
each fiber. Now, this white that is surrounding all the fibers are going to be called the perimysium. And the outer layer cover is the epimysium. Is that clear? Question for yeah. example, open eyes, open ears. Okay? Yes. That's it? No, it's not it. So let's continue. So, and that is the last. So each endomysium, this each endomysium that is a membrane surrounding, is a fiber surrounding, it's a membrane surrounding the fiber, they're going to produce a they are going to continue all the way because the fiber is like this, very, very long fiber. And these fiber are going to basically continue the endomysium towards this area to get attached to the tendon, to the bone. So this is actually lay uh, the membranes of the endomysium. Then the membranes of the fascicles called the perimysium are going to do the same, are going to do the same. They are going to get into the bone like this. All the, all the, all the what? The uh, perimysium. All the perimysium. And at the end, we are going to have the, well, okay are going to have the outer the outer membrane also running they are going to go into the bone again that is the epimysium so this area that is formed by endomysiums perimysiums and epimysium this area is called the tendon so what is the tendon a tendon is the confluence of all the membranes surrounding the cells or fascicles or muscle of the of the muscle. So what is a tendon? Tendon is the group of endomysiums, perimysiums, and epimysiums. You okay with that? Got it. Yeah. Okay. So tell me one thing. Probably you understand something practical here. Uh, send me. Oh, I need to go to the. Oh, oh, I cannot have. I don't have time for that. Okay, so let's go here. All right. So here we have the the striate muscle. All right. So this striate muscle. This is important to understand the anatomy later on. So I'm going to draw something here. So here we have. I'm going to draw a muscle cell cell muscle like this. This is a striate muscle. The typical, then we are going to talk later on about the smooth muscle. And you have the striations here. A striation here. These striations are these. Can you see the striations here? One, two, three striations, right? We got it? Yep. Okay. So these striations, this can you see that this is a striation, a striation, a striation, a striation. You see here, I'm going to make a close up about this. About this, a close up is going to be here. So, this red, this red thick area is going to be this. Okay, and this thin area you see on the sides, thin area, thin area are going to be above and below. Can you see here? Yes. Okay. That is called the sarcomere. But more important than that, I want you to remember that these striations, what are made of? These striations, this red, are going to be called the myosin. Myosin is a protein. Myosin is a protein. Myosin is a protein. And these blue small lines are going to be the actin. 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 
So what are these four? So now you need to get familiar with the names actin and myosin. So when you are doing exercises, you are having more actin and myosin. And just to finish this, can you give me five minutes, please? After after two? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, yeah. All right. so we have here, I'm going to put it in, in here, I'm going to put it, the, uh, the, the, my, the myosin. The myosin are going to be proteins that are going to have like a hooks like this. Hooks, like a hunger hooks, something like that, in this direction, exactly as in this direction. Then we have on the top, we are going to have the actin. This is the actin. I, I don't like that. Actin. Okay, actin. And the actin, look at it. How are I going to make the, the hooks of the product of actin? This is one actin. Acting, 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 acting. And here are going to be acting, 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 acting. So each red, this like a commas, are myosin, 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 myosin. This is acting, 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 acting. So what happened with this? When you have, and look at my hands now, you're going to have these hooks. This is the myosin, let me see. This is the myosin, but the acting is like this. It's not like that. It's not the same in the same direction. It's the opposite. So, and we have many of these myosin in this, in this position, and many of these acting in this position. So if I go into do this, like this, it's like rolling one over another like this. They're going to hook, and that is going to produce a contraction of the muscle. When you're going to have relaxation, the muscle is doing this, and separate again. You got it? Look at these hooks. Is that clear or not? Yep. Okay. All right, so that correlates with the sodium, potassium, chloro, magnesium, chlor uh, that we talked in the past. You can tell that during the contraction, what happened? Sodium and calcium. And during the relaxation, potassium, chloro, magnesium. Out of the cell. See how everything is coming together? I going to, we are going to tune that in anatomy physiology. All right, so is that clear? Let's go to the last part. Give me five minutes. Okay, so let's go some muscles here. All right, so main muscles. We are going to talk about the deltoid muscle. Deltoid muscle. This is the deltoid mus muscle in the shoulder, right? This, this portion. It's like my hand here. So contract the muscle. Contract the muscle, my, my arm is going away from my body. That's called abduction. So another time, but they are going to contraction actually elevate my shoulder, right? Deltoid. Deltoid is important, why? Because they are going to have intramuscular injections. So maximum three mLs, three mLs, no more than three mLs. So deltoid muscle, this is the deltoid muscle. Then we have the, uh, the pectoralis major. This is the pectoralis major. Pectoralis major. This pectoralis major below or under, if you move out the pectoralis major, you have the pectoralis minor. This is important. Why? Because you will see some women who have breast implant, breast implant, they put it behind the pectoralis major, behind the pectoralis minor. Pectorally, so those are the push-ups. Then we have the biceps brachii. Biceps brachii is this on the on the on the on the arm. So you contract. This is the brachius uh, uh, muscle. You contract, relax. So contraction of the biceps will produce the flexion of the upper extremity. Okay, but posteriorly here we have another muscle that is called the triceps, 
What is the price of here? They don't show the tricep here. What is the what kind of picture is it? What is oh there you are? <laughs> triceps. The triceps is here behind. So when you having the triceps, look at this. When you contract the triceps, contract contraction of the triceps. Right? Yes or no? That is going to extend the for the upper extremity. So the contraction of the triceps contract are going to extend the upper extremity. So now I have two muscles, the biceps and the triceps. When the biceps are going to contract, the triceps relax. When the triceps contract, the biceps relax. So the biceps and the triceps are antagonic muscles. Muscles, the biceps and the triceps. You okay with that? Yep. Okay. Another muscles that we need to remember are going to be the quadriceps femoris, bastus lateralis, bastus medial. We have four bastus. So this is actually one of the strongest muscles in the body, the quadriceps femoris. That is on the front of your thigh. That is area of intramuscular injections as well. And the, another muscle here is going to be the latissimus dorsi. Latissimus dorsi. If you go to the gym, you see these guys doing exercises, like a rowing, right? And they have the, the, the back like a shape like a B, right? You saw that? Uh, you see that? Uh oh, you saw that in the gym? No? Yeah, I've seen it. No, nobody? Yeah. So that is the yeah. latissimus dorsi. The latissimus dorsi is the largest muscle on the back. Latissimus dorsi is the largest muscle on the back. Which one is the largest muscle on the body? The largest muscle on the body are going to be the gluteus maximus, the maximum, the the the, the, the biggest muscle in the body is the gluteus maximus. Latissimus dorsi is the largest muscle on the back of the uh, on the back of the of the of the person. You okay with that? Yep. And the last yep. one are going to be the rectus abdominis. This is what we call the six packs. Somebody has one pack, right? But six packs is one, two, three, no, one. Uh, what is that? Where are six packs? Okay, so one, two, and three. So those are the pairs. So the six packs, two, four, six. All right, so the last muscle I'm going to mention is that trapezius muscle. The trapezius muscle are going to be on the back, on the top. This is the latissimus dorsi. Here is the trapezius muscle. This trapezius muscle, trapezius, is make you climb. You have an, you're climbing, you are going to the la ladder, you want to go up. That is the trapezius muscle, trapezius muscle. All right, so that's all for today. Any question, please? Erin, how was the class today? It's good. Um, which part is, which part do you, you like more? Or you didn't like anything or something? Uh, I like the uh, anima. The what? The muscles? The, yeah, the muscles. Okay. Something that you need, we need more emphasis. You think that we need to explain again? No. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Erin. Marilyn, please. Yeah, class was good. 
Um, again, I like how you describe each thing to something in real life. So thank you. Anything to improve, let me know, please. Okay. Miss O, thank you. Miss O is starting to study already. Miss O, she's very interested. Yes. Tell me, what do you think about the class? What need to be improved or something? Um, the class is quite interesting. Um, but the most I like is about the blood, hemoglobin, and um, uh, but it is too much to study. Okay, and I would like to know how many questions will be, uh, for the quiz. Ten questions, yes, usually. Miss Only ten questions. Okay. I can and give you more. That... If you want more? I can give more. Yeah. And then, no? uh, is there any yes, any no, no, review sorry. class tomorrow? Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, is yes. Is there any review class tomorrow? Tomorrow, yes. Yeah. We're going to be eight eight thirty. Eight thirty. Okay. Okay. Okay, I can join tomorrow. And uh, when is the uh, final exam? In two weeks. It's going to be. In two weeks. Next week. Wednesday? It means, oh, oh, it's in the syllabus, no, yeah. All right, so. 18. It's the uh, 15th. It's on 15. So we have, uh, no this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. Yes. Okay. And so is there a quiz for uh, uh, lecture 19? Is, is what? A, a, a quiz the for quiz what? is for uh, lecture 19. No, no. Because oh, the the exam, final exam is all the lectures. All the lectures, but for the lecture 19, uh, there will be a quiz. No, 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 no. They are actually going to be part of the final exam. Okay. Okay. And the, 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 if you can post it, um, the previous lecture for the final exam right now, just it is better for us. We can review early. We will have more time to. Okay, okay, Miss O. Is any inquiry yeah. or something? Text me, please. Okay, or call me. Yes. Free to yes. do it any that. Mr. Yeah. Linia, Thank please. you. Thank you, Miss O. Our class was good. I really liked the. Um, I didn't know that sickle cell was a evolutionary trait from malaria. That was really cool to learn. Yeah, that's it's very good. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anything to improve? Please let me know. I open to to some changes or adapt or to make it better. Okay, thank you, uh, Miss Marcel. Please. Lecture was good. Um, I really like the section about anemia because I was only familiar with a couple of them, but it was interesting. Okay, okay, Miss Marcel. Muchísimas gracias. So I hope you enjoy as much and enjoy this. I think the next class is going to be immune system. And it's one of my super favorite. I'm telling you, wow, that is going, we are going to learn a lot. So please try to read ahead of time. And um, I know that some of you are doing that and you have excellent results. I suggest this is your last two weeks. So don't lose the pace, increase the pace. Okay, so two more weeks, please. And we are going to finish our course. I don't, uh, please, I really want to do on time what don't wait until the end to start doing things. It's not going to, the, the time we lost before is not going to be recovery at all. So the best time is to study now. Okay, all right, muchas gracias. Thank you so much. I will see you next time. and. Uh, any question, any doubt, uh, I am going to just text me or call me, and I will see you guys tomorrow at 8.30 for the tutoring for this exam, for this quiz. Okay? Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stay until the end if somebody wants to talk to me or something. I'm going to cut the, the recording.